call to worship for this morning will be responsive, but you will be responding with your body and not with your voices. So as you hear a particular action, uh, I invite you to join in with me and do that action. Worshiping God is a full body experience. We raise our hands in praise. We clap making a joyful noise to the Lord. We stomp our feet to proclaim we are here to worship. We hold our hearts to invite God as creator, redeemer, and sustainer home in us now and always. Using all that we are and all that we have, let us worship the Lord our God, and let's do so singing together, how great is our God. As we come together in prayer, I invite you to put your hands into two fists, because often we walk through our days holding on to all of the stuff we have, our grocery lists, our to-do lists, our work, um, how hard we think we should be playing. So we're going to have our hands in fists, and then as we hear our assurance, the forgiveness that God gives us, we will open our hands up wide and we will receive all that God has to offer and let go of all 
that we hold on to. So let's pray together. Holy God, the mystery of your presence stretches far beyond us, yet we know you draw near to us in Christ. Walking beside us, guiding us with wisdom, loving us with boundless grace. Your spirit encourages us as we follow Christ and gives us the energy and insight we need to serve you. Holy God, we are glad to gather in your presence, to be embraced by your mystery and your mercy. For we confess we do need your mercy. We claim to be your people, but we forget to love as you do. We claim to seek your guidance, but we often turn from your ways. We ask for your forgiveness, but we fail to forgive as you forgive. We claim to listen for your word, but we ignore your wisdom. Hear us as in this silence, we offer you our personal confessions. Forgive us, God of mystery and mercy. Amend who we are and direct who you would have us to be. For the sake of Christ, our Savior and friend, in whose name we pray. Amen. Friends, the good news never gets old. God knows us and loves us. It is as much and as simple as that. We are forgiven, loved, and set free to start again. Thanks be to God. The, the scripture this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went out and, and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity, that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they said, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, O God. Amen. Star Wars. I have a suspicion that even the mere mention of the major motion, motion picture franchise has you either thumb humming the theme song, imagining your favorite characters, or thinking not another sermon using Star Wars as a theological archetype. But when reading about today's passage in Matthew, one article referred to Admiral Akbar and his famous line, it's a trap. I have not been able to shake this line from my mind, so I decided to quiz my Star Wars loving husband about Akbar, and we did some further research. A veteran commander, Akbar, led the defense of his home world, Moncala, during the Clone Wars, and then masterminded the rebel attack on the second Death Star at the Battle of Endor. Akbar realized the rebels had been drawn into a trap at Endor, but adjusted with his fleet buying valuable time for the attack to succeed. He became a Grand Admiral in the New Republic, winning many victories until his retirement, but was coaxed back into service with the resistance by Leia Organa. For someone with one of the most quoted lines within the Star Wars universe, Akbar had just 14 lines of dialogue in Return of the Jedi, and his total screen time across all films totaled only three minutes and 30 seconds. Like Christ, 
Akbar didn't have a lot of time, but he did a lot with the time that he did have. I'm sure you weren't expecting me to compare Jesus to a non-human leader of the resistance within Star Wars, but here we are. Jesus also had prior experience with those he was battling and the empire they represented. Like Akbar, Jesus knew what he was getting into when they asked him, tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Just as Akbar adjusted the resistance's attack plan, Jesus adjusted his response asking, why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And whose head is this and whose title? The Pharisees and Herodians answered, Caesar's. Jesus then replied simply, give therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. No matter how Jesus answers this question, he gets into trouble. He's in this position quite a bit. It is one of those gotcha moments, not unlike the ones we hear about during the ever constant political coverage. Just like leaders today, Jesus finds himself in a sticky situation and needs a diplomatic answer. If he advises them not to pay the tribute money, Jesus will be accused of treason. If he advises them to pay, he would be settling, setting aside the law of God. So Jesus, as always, takes another path and replies with a challenging thought. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. So often we shy away from talking about money in the church because it is considered a very private and personal topic. But the issue lies in that we all need money to live in today's society, in our world. Money provides a roof over our head, food on the table, and clothing on our backs. Money allows us to meet our basic physiological needs, which fosters our ability to be product productive members of society and the communities we participate in. The flip side of this particular coin is what happens when the money we need to survive in our capitalist society becomes what we worship. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, we read in the King James translation, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which, will, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So it is not having money or needing money to survive that is the true issue here, or paying taxes even, but rather what the worship of money can do to us on an emotional, mental, and spiritual level. Just like Jesus' reality when answering the Pharisees and Herodians, people were expected to follow the laws of the empire, and today is no different. We have bylaws to abide, speed limits to drive within, taxes to pay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what stands out is the cultural laws that we have placed upon us by society. The social norms that dictate how we behave based on gender roles, how our family is structured, how we dress, or even how we are to act in church. When I hear Jesus' answer ringing in my ears, I can't help but think that as Christians, we can respect these social norms when they honor people. But when they dishonor or disregard or disrespect God's beloved children, they are not something we need to accept. This reminds me of a t-shirt from the 90s that I saw at many a youth retreat I attended. It was a cartoon school of fish, and one fish was facing the opposite direction to the others. And the slogan written across was, go against the flow. 
And so we are a part of this world because we are a part of this world as people. And we have worldly responsibilities like our taxes, unfortunately. But those elements do not dictate our hearts because they are not Caesars. They are not the emperors. They are gods. And with all of this in mind, we are driven back to ask what does belong to Caesar and what does belong to God? According to Susan Grove Eastman, a New Testament professor at Duke Divinity School, she writes something. She writes that some early interpreters looked to the image on the coin and answered the coins, bearing Caesar's image belong to Caesar and human beings bearing God's image belong to God. Thus, Tertullian, writing early in the third century, said, render to Caesar, Caesar's image, which is on the coin, and to God, God's image, which is on man, on humans, on humanity, on all of us. The question of what is truly lawful can be answered only by looking forward to Jesus' teaching on the greatest of the commandments which grounds his debates with the religious leaders in the later verses of this chapter of Matthew. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The fulfillment of the law, including the question of whether or not to pay taxes, is that which grows out of complete devotion to God expressed in love of one's neighbor. So let us love our neighbor and honor the image of God seen on the face of all God's beloved children. Amen. And let's sing together, we lay our broken world. Let's come before God in prayer once again. God of our hearts and our hopes, 
As the season continues to change and harvests are gathered, we thank you for the beauty around us. For brilliant colors, birds flying south, the crackle of fallen leaves, and the rhythms of this time of year. We are grateful for your steadfast love amid so many changes. This autumn, we also face unpredictable changes as the pandemic continues. Draw close to those who find the uncertainty unsettling and help us preserve our connection to you and to each other. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of imagination and insights, we thank you for all the ways you inspire human minds to create things which improve the lives of your people. We are grateful for all the medical efforts taken to manage COVID-19 and for the scientists text testing vaccines, giving them perseverance and success. Guide politicians and policymakers so that breakthroughs and resources are shared with the most vulnerable. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of neighbors and neighborhoods, we praise you for everyone working to build and maintain healthy communities. For teachers and librarians, healthcare workers, coaches, construction workers, farmers and laborers, store clerks and wait staff. So many have had their workplaces changed and their livelihoods threatened by the pandemic. Give them perseverance and encouragement. Make us good neighbors to all who serve our community and remind us to say thank you. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of comfort and compassion. We pray for all those who are struggling this autumn, whatever the reason. We remember before you those facing illness or waiting for treatment, those who have lost income and worry about winter expenses and shelter, those who are grieving the loss of someone close, like Catherine, David, Anne, Reuben, Ben, and Daniel, and those whose mental health is under pressure these days. Awaken your people around the world to attend to the needs of those at risk in our communities so that they know that you will comfort them and offer your compassion and that we do the same. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With gratitude for your love poured into the world through Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. And let's sing together once again, I'm going to live so God can use me. I'm going to live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to live so God can use me. Yeah. 
now as those who have found favor in the sight of God, be imitators of Jesus Christ and an example to all of the life of faith. To the world in which you live, give your love and service. And to God, give all that you are and all that you shall be. And may the glory of God's goodness be revealed to you. May the grace and peace of Jesus Christ take root in you. And may the inspiration of the Holy Spirit fill you with joy today and always. Let us go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.